Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brandon. It's great to be here. I appreciate it. Maybe can you start by introducing yourself? Tell us, tell our listeners a little bit about you uh, and how you got to GCM Grosvenor. Uh, a couple of stages there. So my name is Peter Braffman. I'm a managing director and the head of real estate at GCM Grosvenor. Um, I have been uh, in the alternative space before we even called it alternatives. I don't know what we called it when we started, but it goes back at this point, you know, <laughs> many years, like since the mid 1980s. So it's been a while. Um, and, um, I mean, the short answer is, um, Grosvenor acquired a platform that I used to work at. I was a part of something called the Customized Fund Investment Group, um, at Credit Suisse. Um, and, uh, GCM or Grosvenor acquired that. By the way, just so everyone understands, this is different than the UK Grosvenor. Um, they're all friends of mine, great people. And GCM, just so everyone understands a little bit of this, is um, it's, a, again, a large alternative asset management platform. It's diversified across um, hedge funds and private market activities like private equity and real estate. And they were just a, they were a hedge fund um, out of Chicago. And then they wanted to become a full-service firm. They bought this, this customized fund group out of Credit Suisse, which started as a private equity shop and then started including other asset classes like infrastructure and real estate. I started that platform at Credit Suisse in 2010, um, and then we were acquired by Grosvenor. I'll talk more about Grosvenor in a little bit. Um, but like before that, you know, I, I've just had a history at other firms. I, I got into, I started way back in the day, again, the 80s, um, at a small boutique uh, bank called uh, commercial Union Capital. It was a great place. I loved, uh, I'm a big fan of boutiques. You learn a lot. Um, but it was in um, focus on asset-based financing, both project financing and for power assets and real estate. And I did both. That's where I learned finance. I was a biology and history major. I had nothing to do with this stuff, but I was fascinated by by the stuff I wanted to learn and they gave me a shot. So I started working in it. And um and became more and more experienced in real estate, real estate finance, to be clear. And a lot of what we were doing was working out um, some of the old syndicated real estate partnerships back in the 80s. Some people remember what that was, um, but not many. That's fine. But it was a great experience for me. I learned a lot about the asset class. I learned a lot about, honestly, finance in general. Um, and then I was there when kind of the world blew up in the 19, early 1990, or mid-1990, September 1990, to be clear. And, um, and then, uh, you know, we had our first kind of real estate, real real estate moment. Um, after that, I went back to school. I was a biology, I'm sorry, I went to, got my JD and my MBA at Northwestern Kellogg. And I became a lawyer for a few years. I was a lawyer at Kirkland Ellis. Then I went to Goldman Sachs, went back into finance, loved it. Um, similar stuff, working mostly on asset based financing. A lot of structured finance, a lot of real estate and other stuff. But that I've got a much more well-rounded experience there. And then I went to Zurich Alternative Asset Management, and that's where I, I became more of a buy-side investor. And we were investing for our own book there. They set up a, a separate subsidiary to invest their capital. And so we were became direct investors in real estate. That was a little bit different for me as opposed to, you know, financing it for somebody else which is what I did as a banker or what I did, you know, as a boutique bank. It's, you know, you kind of work for someone else. Great. But it's nice to work for our own capital and deploy and, and, and learn and grow. Um, and then we use fund investing as a diversifier. So we were, we, that's how we started getting involved in fund investing. Um, so I kind of had an interesting experience there, both as a direct investor in real estate. We built a big book there, managed a big book, had to build up our own asset management team. And then um, as a fund investor, too, and if you know, go back to the 2000s, that was an interesting time when there was, I call it kind of a great proliferation of fund management. There was a, a lot of new funds entering the market. It was post-RTC in the 90s when we started this whole thing. But in the 2000s, we saw a great proliferation of funds. Um, and um, a lot of them, they were all, quote, unquote, emerging managers. We just didn't call them that then. Because they're all new groups, they're operating partners, uh, decided to launch their own firm, their spin-out teams, launch their own firm. 
uh, just like the early wave after the RTC, these new organizations started, and now we had a lot more. Um, and it was with that in mind that I left right after the G during the GFC to Credit Suisse to focus on startup platforms and emerging managers. So hopefully that gives you an idea, Brandon. Yeah, no, I think it's a great overview. Out of curiosity, you you kind of uh, touched on your Kirkland and Ellis in your JD days. What was the impetus for going to law school? And then why did you not stick with law after you invested in law school? You know, honestly, the the, uh, the people were the most inc- true influences on me when I my first started my career. I just happened to work for all these former lawyers. I, I don't know what it was. Uh, they all became, you know, bankers. They all became finance people. But I love their minds. Like I love the way they thought. I love their um, knowledge um, of the of of law and the way they use that uh, in finance. And my early, my first job as a result was very structuring intensive. Um, and we were so you you had to develop a mastery of not just finance and numbers and but really also of tax law um, and corporate law and accounting. And I love that multidisciplinary uh, aspect of it. It was fun. It was like a big puzzle. And I was just a human sponge. I was just learning all this stuff. I didn't really need to go back to law school for that. But I had a lot of questions, for lack of a better word. Um, everything I learned, I learned on the job. I never had a formal education in any of these things. Um, but I was good at math. Um, and, um, and I, and so that the, the actual work was, it came naturally to me, but it was almost like I was just building a ship in my, you know, with, without a formal education. So I wanted that formal education and I thought, you know what, I'll go back for law and a, and business. So I went both to both schools. A lot of my friends thought I was crazy, um, because it was like, you know, it was, I was taking a step back. I was doing something different. Um, I didn't probably need to do it. And sometimes when I counsel kids today, like, should I do that? I'm like, I'm not so sure. That's it. I met my wife, uh, it changed my life. And so, you know what? It's okay. It all worked out great. So I'm glad I did it, but it, it was a number of years, uh, that all of a sudden here I was in my mid twenties when I left. And then next thing I know, when I come back in the workforce, I'm like 30. And so that, that changes things a little bit. So, you do have to think about that when you make those kind of career moves. Absolutely. And then you mentioned in the early 2000s, post RTC, which is the Resolution Trust Corp, there was a proliferation of funds. What what do you think created, you know, what was the driver behind that? It's a great question. There's a couple of drivers. So, I, I mean, I think if you go back to 1992 um, with, with the Resolution Trust Corporation and um, it was a real interesting moment, um, and uh, it was an opportunity to really invest in real estate cheaply. So we didn't really have opportunity funds before then. The more core funds, groups were investing um, on balance sheet for u- user-owned. You know, again, you had some groups like JMB and Morgan Stanley. You had a f- number of groups doing stuff. Blackstone was just getting going. I mean, they are mostly on really on the private equity side. You didn't find, have a lot of groups here in, um, investing in opportunistic real estate. But something that was happening on the sidelines was forcing capital to search for additional return. And if you think about, you know, plan sponsors and institutional capital in general, it really started coming into the markets in the early 1980s. Before that, it was highly constrained. It's a very safe investing. Um, and at the time, you know, interest rates were super high. Early 80s, interest rates were six, 15, 16%, where it was like the 30 year. So it's like crazy, right? It's so really high. If your actual rate of return was an 8%, all you had to do was invest in treasuries. You're, you're very happy. Like you're, you're making a lot of money. Well, guess what? By the early 90s, that was now 7%. Um, and all of a sudden you had to work a lot harder to get those kind of returns. Uh, allocation alternatives at that point was three, four percent, maybe, you know, um, and to everything else to, you know, to bonds and stocks it was, it was, it was the rest of it, mostly in, in bonds and treasuries. So interest rates began their long secular design, uh, decline 
um, to the point where they, you know, they started getting lower and lower and lower. You can correlate, you can literally see, I mean, it's kind of a fascinating chart we have somewhere. You show interest rates decline, you show the allocations to alternatives went up. Now allocations to alternatives are sort of like 30% among institutional capital. And it's all about searching for return. So to answer your question, um, that capital was coming for alternatives, is looking at private equity, is looking at real estate. Those are the two, and it started looking at hedge funds as well. Those were the, the real sources of, of returns. Um, and then, um, and then when withers capital, I think, uh, businesses will form around it. So the other thing that started happening is as these firms, the early movers started getting bigger and bigger, they started training more and more people, more and more people started spinning out of these organizations and launching new firms. And we did another study where we showed, you know, if you take the top 10 or 11 firms from 1990, and there are only like 10 of them that really control most of the capital. All the big firms came out of these firms. And then all the next big firms came out of those firms. And so you start with like, 10 and you wind up with like hundreds after that, all coming from this like tree. So, um, and then there are lots of reasons. Like, you know, people leave for lots of reasons. There's volatility in the market. Their promotes aren't worth, worth as much. Uh, they, um, uh, you know, they just want to be there. They, they have cultural issues at the firm. They can't get much higher. The, 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 the founder is keeping all the economics. There are lots of reasons. People leave, but there was capital. And the capital was searching for a home, and it found it in new firms. So literally, you know, if we started with 50 or so firms in the early 90s, by the mid-2000s, we had like thousands. And it was just like remarkable. and just kept on growing. I would love to see that tree. If you can uh, dig up that that research, I think it's fascinating. I know from my time at ULI, there's these nodes of influence. I know, you know, uh, Kenneth Leventhal and Associates on the West Coast spun out a whole crop of people. Trammell Crow Company spun out a whole crop of people. You know, going all the way back. So I think I think it's fascinating. And you know, they they take the culture of the the founding company with them. Oftentimes, they do. They take the culture with them. They take lessons learned with them. They do lots of things. It's really kind of fascinating. When, I, when we put this together, I sat around, I did the first chart, and I sent around to friends, they added, then I sent around to a lot of people on that chart and said, what do you think? And they filled in more stuff. So it was a lot of fun to like send this out because I've known a lot of these people in the industry. So it's fun seeing their all their input on that chart. So I, I will send around, I need to update it because I haven't updated in about five or six years. It's amazing. So let's um, let's fast forward. So today, tell us a little bit about GCM Grosvenor. You mentioned you know you're a large alternative asset manager and you run the real estate business. But zoom out. Let's start with you know the parent company GCM Grosvenor, and then let's talk about the real estate business specifically. Sure. So GCM Grosvenor, it's um, I'll get the numbers wrong. Somewhere between seventy five and eighty billion dollars in size. Well diversified across the asset classes: hedge funds, private equity. You know, infrastructure, real estate, credit. Um, and very interesting because when you think about going back to our history that we just talked about before, you know, institutional capital was searching for homes, searching for access to alternatives. And a lot of everything is really about access. How do you get access? How do you find it? Who do you work with? Um, Grosvenor, uh, in, based in Chicago, was one of the early movers in that. So they were an early mover in hedge funds and they grew meaningfully as institutional capital was, was entering the business. Same thing at the same time that was happening, it was happening in the credit suite side as well. And so it was kind of both sides of the business kind of grew up the same way. So, I mean, we've been one firm for a long time now. Um, and that one firm is, is, has a kind of an interesting pedigree, which is, you know, the way we we grew is that we created kind of a, a curated experience for our institutional partners for the most part. A lot of our capital comes in the form of separate accounts, separate accounts that you are a fund of ones, um, where that LP has kind of an interesting um, experience, you know, or a very personal experience with with us. We design portfolios for these for the for the, for our partners very often the, the those portfolios overlap with other portfolios that 
you know, other institutional capital um, has. So it's, we could scale our business, we could grow our business. But that's an interesting vagary. I think 75% of our capital is held in the form of these fund of ones. And we have hundreds of institutional capital partners across the whole business. So that gives you an idea of the, of the formation. Increasingly, we have custom, we have actually commingled funds as well. Um, but that just gives you an idea that of our capital base, it's, it's diversified, but a lot of, a lot of it's institution, institutional. Peter, on that, on that topic, how does that, from a practical perspective, how does that work? Do you have a thesis that you then take out to the market and say, you know, we really believe in XYZ niche asset class. You know, we see managers, A, B, and C who we could invest with. You know, let, let's sign up a separate account. Or are you in meetings, investors and their consultants are telling you what they're looking for, and then you're building out kind of a strategy around that? You know, honestly, it could be a little bit of both. Um, and both things have happened. So, you know, we just, I think a lot of our business's relationship, it's long-term relationship, it's building that kind of trust and talking with LPs for long periods of time. Um, and we listening and, and seeing what is it they need. The other piece is that we're also coming with ideas of like, what is it we're doing? What do we think is the opportunity? There could be very discrete opportunities, like, as you said, let's for real estate, we're focused on a niche asset. Um, often it's, and this is probably a worthwhile diving into a little bit, it's kind of focusing on, I'd say, the middle market opportunities that are out there where it's harder for them, these LPs, to get access to. Because a lot of our LPs, when you think about it, they, they're big. They're the household names. They're some of the biggest groups out there. Um, and then, and then others. And so they have their choice of groups to work with, but getting into the middle market, finding the nuances out there in the marketplace is a little harder. And there's a theme that I just have seen, and we can talk about it more and more. And I call it like the commoditization of, 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 of finance. Um, and I think if the 1990s represented a moment, and this is true in real estate, but I think it's true across all asset classes, that we saw a lot of capital coming in, searching for alternatives, looking for yield, trying to figure out who to work with. In the 2000s, seeing a, a great proliferation, we've seen kind of more and more consolidation in that, um, in that space over time. And that the more institutional capital out there and the more managers looking for opportunities, Returns get harder to, to distinguish from each other. There's more beta in the system and less alpha. And so I like to think, I mean, Grosvenor does, GCM Grosvenor does a lot of things, but I think one of the things we do pretty well, um, is that we look for those more fragmented parts of markets that are harder to find and therefore have a little bit more of that embedded alpha in them. You know, there's just a little less, less commoditized. So that started in the 2000s, I'd say, um, roughly. Again, this is my view. This is my interpretation. Um, with focus on like middle market buyout or middle market opportunities. Um, and I, 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 you know, most of our investments have that kind of flavor. Um, and from that came this, the notion of the emerging managers. The emotion, emerging managers are very much a middle market concept. It's finding small, discrete teams, early stage teams that are going to root out opportunities that the big shops can't, don't have, you know, they just can't efficiently access. I'll give you a stat. Um, and this is true in real estate, but again, I think you can find similar data. Um, 95% of all opportunities are deals that are $50 million or less in real estate. And yet over 50% of all capital goes to deals that are bigger than that. So as, as, as our business has gotten more institutionalized, as firms getting bigger and bigger to manage more money, they are by nature have to deploy that money and deploy it efficiently have to go for bigger deals or bigger opportunities. So most of the capital is chasing that kind of opportunity that just means there's a lot of asset deals, a lot of opportunities that are smaller. And so the middle market and the emerging managers have, a, uh, have an interesting seat in finding those opportunities. So, you know, that's something that's a big part of what Grosvenor does. 
So let's talk about, so the real estate business, give us an overview of the way that, you know, the different strategies in which you invest, and then maybe a little bit about the size and scale of, of the platform in real estate. When we, when I first started, <laughs> you know, my, I was like going back into the history of these things, but um, it, it helps give some context. When we started, um, we were seated uh, primarily by Texas teachers. Um, and um, they provide a couple hundred million to start um, a program focused on emerging managers in real estate. And in its early days, it was conceived as a fund investment opportunity. We would invest in funds. And just one step back, uh, Grosvenor, GCM Grosvenor does you know, pretty much open architecture. We'll invest in funds. We'll invest directly in assets or opportunities and everything in between, secondaries, you name it. So we'll do a little bit of everything. One thing we're not is we're not a consultant. So we are an investment management firm. Um, and just so people understand and distinguish kind of what we do. But in real estate, it was, you know, focused sort of like what we had done on the buyout side in, in private equity. Focus on funds, focus on co-invest. That's how we started. Um, but over time, that kind of evolved. And it evolved for a number of reasons. But, um, you know, one, I felt passionately about this. And this kind of goes to your question before. How do you work with your LPs? We have a very intimate relationship with our LPs. We talk to them all the time. We have pipeline calls all the time. I mean, like every few weeks. Um, and after the first wave of managers and opportunities that we invested in here, um, we saw, we realized that, you know, that was a great moment. And just for context, that was post GFC, it was 2010. Um, there was a great, there were a number of really interesting teams spinning out of firms. We backed some of the best, I think. They did incredibly well. But then we started realizing there were all these great teams that were out there that probably would become great fund managers. But as you and I have talked about before, Brandon, it's hard to raise a fund. It's getting harder and harder to raise a fund. And all these great groups that I started with in 2010 or 11 had actually gotten backing in some form from some other organization, had gotten someone else to be a strategic partner before they went out and raised a fund. And I started realizing, you know, we should be doing that. We should get earlier. We should work with those teams and be that strategic partner. We should invest directly in their assets um, and think about the business more dynamically. So we went to a number of our LPs and new LPs, and we've been growing the business ever since along those lines. We'll talk more specifically about what that means. But today, um, you know, 80% of what we do is invest directly in assets as opposed to in funds. So it's a very different model than when we started. Again, we started with a couple hundred million. We've had now close to 7 billion of commitments from, from our LPs. Um, I think our NAV is, our AUM is roughly like 6 billion. Um, so it gives you an idea in terms of what we do. It's all value add and opportunistic. Um, investing, there's no, we don't, we're not a core or core plus investor. We invest across every asset class you can imagine, certainly all the major food groups, but all the niches as well, or the adjacencies. And I, I see by last count, it was either 15 or 19 different asset classes, depending on how you count them. So, you know, there are just lots of niches out there that are getting interesting, but we could talk about that. But, um, but we really, we, we really have kind of explored and we continue to explore lots of new ways to, for real estate to express itself. Most of what we do is in the U.S., about seven, historically, like 90%. But increasingly, we've been focusing on Europe as well. You know, uh, UK, the Nordics, mainland Europe. Um, and I think that's going to continue to be the case uh, because we follow certain trends here that we're seeing over there as well. Most of what we do is equity. So we buy assets, acquire them. But about 30% of what we do is some form of credit. Uh, investing will lend um, on a senior or you know subordinate basis. Um, yeah, so that's that's uh, that hopefully gives you some context of the practice. So just to make sure that I understand, when you're talking about an asset in this context, you're talking about like a physical, you know, piece of real estate, not an operating business or anything else. Is that correct? Well, that's a 
it's a great distinction. I mean, yes. So when I say assets, that is what I'm referring to. So when I say we invest directly, um, we're investing in assets. We're buying buildings. Uh, we're buying land. We're doing, you know, we're improving assets. We're developing assets. But always with a partner, always with someone on the ground. And, and it's that relationship that we're trying to um, maximize and, and be a strategic partner to them. Um, and that goes to your second point. Like, is it, you know, it's something else that you're investing in? And the truth is we are. Like, we are also, as we're a strategic partner to these teams, we're looking for these teams to grow their businesses. And we're looking to be a partner in those businesses as well. Um, and that could come in the form of some kind of ownership in that business um, or could be warrants in that business or some something or some kind of revenue share in that business. And we're going to be a strategic partner to them, not just in terms of providing LP dollars to provide assets, but GP dollars to in, you know invest alongside them because as you scale a business, you need more GP capital. You know, working capital support their overhead. So we really try to provide a lot of support in order to gain get some kind of position with respect to their the value of the the business that they're building. Is that a prerequisite, or um, how do you think about that that the working capital, GP capital, kind of stakes investing? It's not a prerequisite. We're looking for the best opportunities to invest in real estate because at the end of the day, we're a real estate investor. I'd say, but we're looking for some kind of strategic partnership. Uh, what we're not is like, hey, just show us a great deal. Let's just do a great deal. That's a fine business, but we're not built for that. You know, what we're built for is to work with a team and say, we want to be build a 10, 15, 20 year relationship. And not just with us, but also with our LPs. So we want some different kind of relationship with them. And um, and so how we structure that matters. So we don't have to get a stake. Or we don't have to do anything. And we're, we're very careful. I will, you and I could talk more about how we think about that because there's a lot of stake investing going on out there. There are lots of nuances and vagaries. We try to position ourselves at one end of that spectrum, a little bit different, we hope, than the others. Um, but we're providing a certain kind of relationship with these groups. And um, the most important thing to us is that they see the value of that relationship and we can come to some kind of terms where it makes sense for them, it makes sense for us. Uh, but no, it's not like they're, they're, we have to always be careful that, you know, if we're only looking for groups who are willing to do whatever, we there's there's some biases that come with that, so we got to be careful about that. So we're, we're we try to think about always take a step back and say, what are we trying to do? What's our goal? Why do we want to invest with this group? And you know what you know what kind of access are we getting by doing so? So before we get into some of the details, because I do want to unpack that with you, maybe a few kind of definitional terms. So how are you thinking about what is an emerging manager? How do you define that? So there's a technical definition of an emerging manager, and that is a, um, and this is something that a lot of states enact. There's a legislative or political element to it. Um, a lot of um, plans enact uh, guidelines, but the traditional definitions, and it's pretty broad, are teams that have less than two billion of institutional AUM, have um, less than you know three funds or less in the market or managing three or fun, three funds or less and their fundraise is less than a billion dollars. So, um, pretty broad, you know, uh, so a group that could have a you know, billion and a half of capital and on their third fund is still technically an emerging manager. I would say that's the definition where we focus and where we want to focus and where our investors want us to focus on much earlier stage. Most of the teams that we work with um, are, they, they have no AUM. You know, they're just getting going or they have nominal AUM. They have a partner or they've done some stuff. They've done a few deals. So that's where we spend the vast majority of our time. But to your question like earlier, it's not a prerequisite. We'll look like we've invested with some later stage emerging managers because it made sense. But it's, it's it, our, our focus is much earlier. 
A lot of people think about emerging manager and connect it to institutional capital. And you mentioned some legislation in your like in your mind. How do you think about the difference between groups that have institutional capital and groups that are kind of institutionally investable or institutional grade? Is it a require? Like, how do you you know how, how important is the type of capital before you get there to your investing thesis? You know, it's honestly we're very. Um, uh, and I don't want to use the word agnostic, but I actually, it's quite the opposite. I um, I just look for teams that have figured out or thinking about aggressively and have a path to raising capital. And um, so uh, there are plenty of teams that come to us and they, they're institutional quality, but they've never, they had, they're not managing institutional money. They are, it's all fan, high net wealth or retail capital or family office capital. And I think that's great. So one of the things that I, I think a lot about my team does, we all think about all the time is not only are the, do these groups have to be good investors, but they have to be good business builders. And to be a good business builder, one of the prerequisites or one of the essential items is they know how to raise money. And we want our the groups that we work with to raise third party capital. Unlike other opportunity funds that are out there, we don't want to just keep these groups exclusive. We want these groups to grow, and we want to have a exclusive, maybe strategic relationship with them. That's great, but um, we want to enable them to raise other money. And if early on they're raising high net wealth money, great. We've seen some groups raise tons of high net wealth capital or retail capital. And uh, we think it's fantastic. Um, So we kind of separate that from the institutional nature. And what we mean by institutional nature is really, it's not that they're good or bad. Most of the groups we see are fantastic. They're, they're They're great investors. But to manage institutional capital, to your point, they need certain, they need to build certain systems and certain reporting requirements and um, and provide certain kinds of transparency that um, may not be obvious to them or obvious to groups and takes time to develop, quite frankly. Some people have a leg up because they've worked at big shops before. They've seen a lot of that stuff. But we've seen plenty of groups come that they're just great investors. They, they, you know, they've built an interesting high net wealth channel, but now they want to raise institutional capital and they do the work to build kind of an institutional platform. So we talked a little bit about the definition of emerging manager, institutional capital versus institutional grade. One other term that you mentioned, which I know we're going to get into more in just a moment here, is stakes investing or GP stakes. Can, can you can you get enumerate or, or describe what that what that entails? When you think about any fund manager or any investment management firm, they're managing um, pools of capital. Um, as a general partner, they, they put in money, the LP puts in money, they buy stuff, and then eventually they sell that stuff and they get, they get, and, and, and what does that GP or investment management firm or manager get? Now they get returns from the asset, but they also, they also generate fee revenue. They generate management fee revenue and they generate carry or promote revenue. Um, and, uh, the businesses that they've that they've built to manage the real estate and manage the relationships of the capital eventually has a revenue stream that's pretty durable. Um, and there's a value that that is inherent in that business. Um, there are other generators of value. Sometimes there are operating businesses that really come up that are in and of themselves have, create value as well. But just stick with the investment management platform. I think what what wind up happening is a lot of the LPs out there have gotten much more sophisticated over time. Remember, first in the 1990s and 2000s, LPs were just, all they wanted was access. Um, well, they got it. They got the access and they, they became, they built out their books. And their books became more and more mature. And now their businesses, the, you know, the LPs, have become much more sophisticated. So now a lot of them are going direct, particularly in real estate. You know, you'll see a lot of LPs form 
joint ventures and separate accounts with operators all the time and say, you know, we're going to build out multifamily platform. We'll build out a industrial, you know, uh, portfolio. And we're just, they're, they're, they're not just investing in funds passively anymore. They're getting more and more direct. But I think they started realizing, you know, we're paying a lot of these fees to these investment management firms, which is fine. We're getting something for that. But you know what? We're we're also building the enterprise value of these businesses, and we maybe maybe we should claim some of that back. <laughs> and there are two ways to claim some of back that back. You could cut down on the fees. You could say I'm not going to pay you as much, or you could buy into this, some of these businesses. Um, and so we started to see more and more interest on the LP side to do that. Flip side is the GPs have become more and more willing to do that. Why? Because building businesses and building these businesses takes a long time. Yes, they make a lot of money from the fees and promotes and all this stuff. But the truth is they have to keep reinvesting to grow. And the bigger they grow, the more they have to put in. The more they have to put GP co-invest, the more they have to scale the team, the more they have to build out the platform. And they could finance that in multiple ways, but selling a stake in their business is a pretty efficient way of doing it. And so now a business has come around about stake investing where GPs and LPs are willing to trade uh, and transact. And a number of intermediaries have popped up to kind of capture that space. I think one of the ones that popularize it the most, not to distinguish one from another, would be Dial. Dial was an early um, you know, stake investing platform. Truth is, on the hedge fund side, lots of groups, including Grover, has have done that in the past. But it was successful, and now there've been a lot, there are lots of stake investors. The PE side does it a lot. Um, I actually think of the the PE uh, stake investing opportunities these days. These funds that have grown up to to do this stuff is almost like a modern day fund of funds. It's just a, a fund of stakes. It's like the latest kind of iteration. And the next iteration is for the LPs to say, you know what, I'm just going to go and buy stakes directly. And we have a lot of those conversations with with LPs who say, you know what, I want to buy a piece of an opco. I want to buy a piece of an investment management company. I don't want to invest through a fund. I'm going to do it directly. So that's where this business is going. It's it's really interesting. But we're seeing a lot of groups um, come around to participate in this stake investing. So hopefully that gives you an idea. But at the end of a, it's what it is. It's just owning a piece of a company. And you could be more passive about it. You could be sit on the boards and be much more active. There are lots of variations of how this looks, but that's basically the, the concept. And, and am I right in thinking that that implies you're putting a value on the enterprise, right? I mean, I think that's what you just described. And I, I, you know, we work with a lot of GPs, some of whom raise capital deal by deal. Others are funds. Some have high net worth capital. Some have institutional. But I noticed that in this last um, kind of market cycle, uh, you know, the 20, you know, the COVID period, let's call it, where we're, where we're emerging from today in 2024, there's been a, a renewed emphasis on on building and creating enterprise value. Um, is there more to that than the revenue stream and the teams? Like when you when you look at companies and you're trying to understand the value of the enterprise, what are some of the things that you're looking at, or what are what are the important things that a that a firm should be thinking about if they're trying to determine if their business has actual enterprise value versus, I guess, what just pickers, you know, acquirers and managers of assets? Yeah, it's funny. I remember I had one 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 of my friends is one of our managers. I've known him for a long time. He's great. He's been in the business forever, and. Uh, he said, you know, he got calls from like some of the banks that are really specializing in this and all of them pitching on selling a piece of his business. And first he said, what business? My business is investing in real estate and I have a bunch of funds. And what are you talking about? And they said, no, your, your, your business. And he's like, and then they put out a value and they put on a multiple. And by the way, these multiples have gotten quite heady. It's kind of a remarkable. And by the way, we're no different, GCM Grover. So it's just really kind of it's, it's been great. It's a it's a it's a it's the maturation of our business. Like our business is getting more mature, and this is just part of that journey. So um so anyway, yeah, so um so yeah, so it's like a real the, there is a real value, there's a real market. What do I look for? Um I mean clearly the stickiness of the revenues, um and the ability to grow that revenue base is, is obviously very important. So, um, 
And uh, I'm not sure this is where you were going, but it also made me think. It also means for a lot of groups, like uh, what, you know, there's, there's teams that are excellent at what they do. They've done a great job. If you look back, they have a nice diversified LP base and they have a, a lot of sticky revenues and that's fantastic. But then the next question is, will they be continue to be able to grow? Will they be able to continue to compete? It goes to what you and I were talking about before is our business has become more commoditized. You know, how many more diversified allocators do we need out there? Um, how many more multifamily shops do we need out there? You know, so, so what I look for is, you know, um, are these groups going to last? Because some of the groups I thought were going to be here forever are not. You know, some of them are becoming almost family offices themselves. They don't know how to evolve as they uh, you know, as they keep growing. The flip side is if you get really excited about the niche asset classes, which I like a lot, well, what are they going to be like 10 years from now? Are they going to stick around? So these are all the things you think around. The other things I think about are kind of the secret sauce, the operating businesses themselves. Some groups have really interesting, have built out really interesting operating businesses. Um, some have, are, are tech enabled and very smartly so. Um, and even though the businesses are relatively simple, but they're, they're still really enhanced by how the tech overlay they, they put on these businesses. So it's things like that that I'm looking for in terms of you know, their ability to grow, their ability to evolve, um, and all the different th- things that inform that value. I, th- I yeah, I think I think it's fascinating. We're, we'll continue to to peel away uh, the onion here, but you know, you mentioned earlier that you know there's a continuum for stakes investing or or just kind of you know I- investing in a partnership model, and that you have a really distinct point of view in terms of where your firm sits on that continuum. M- maybe help kind of shed some light on where you are, but also for listeners who don't know how to contrast that with kind of some of the other m- models, maybe like highlight th- the range of kind of ways that firms can partner, but like, you know, let's focus on how you have chosen to do it and why you've chosen that particular way relative to the other options. You can choose to be a, a passive investor in opportunities, which is fine. And fund investing is more of a passive investing. Yeah, you can sit on an advisory board, but you're pretty much a passive investor. Um, the flip side is you could go just totally direct. Um, you could invest directly in assets and uh, buy platforms, wholly own those platforms, make them employees of your own, and um, and build and then and and have all the control you want. And then there's everything in between. <laughs> um, and then you could also so that's from a control at an asset level perspective. The other perspective to kind of think about um, is, you know, when you think about um, what kind of business you may want to buy in. It. And so there are groups like who are very mature businesses and they have 10, 15, 20, 50 million of EBITDA, whatever it is. They, you know, they're, they're, they're stabilized businesses and growing, you know, 100 million EBITDA, whatever, big range. Um, and if you're participating or investing in these kinds of companies, these are companies that have a lot of financial resources. The bigger they are, the more financial resources they have. So the kind of terms that you get and the kind of valuation you're going to get is going to reflect that. Um, or you could invest much earlier companies that have less than a billion, a, a million of EBITDA or less than two million of EBITDA. Maybe they have no, nothing, no EBITDA. Um, but then if you're investing in that kind of company um, or investing with it, you know, that the whole value comes from the capital that you're deploying. So how do you even price that? So it's, it's and it, that's kind of the broad range of things. I think the sweet spot where you see a lot of capital forming is sort of in that smaller middle market and growing middle market company that is like, a, you know, again, somewhat stabilized. Couple million bucks of EBITDA, ten or up to ten million of EBITDA. That's kind of an interesting sweet spot where there's a lot of capital. I think aggregating around where we focus is uh, where we focus is much earlier. So, um, and I don't want to initially take 
platform risk. I want to take asset level risk. So what we do is when we partner with a team, um, we'll uh, joint venture with them um, like any other opportunity or capital partner would with an operating partner. It's a joint venture. We're going to have all the major decision rights. We'll see all the pipeline. We'll give them the opportunity if we say no in a deal to get other capital if they want. But we're going to be their partner um, and buy assets together and build portfolios together, just like uh, any capital partner would. Um, but what we then will do is that, again, we're choosing teams that want to grow their platforms and want to raise third-party capital ultimately. So what we are going to do is use the joint ventures and the portfolios that we've built together to then seed funds or build businesses around. So we're going to scale a team. We'll invest 50, 100, 200 million with the team. And eventually they'll raise third party capital based on the track record that we've created with them or based uh, and based on uh, portfolios that we can uh, attract capital around. So we'll literally take a portfolio that we built, contribute it to a fund in exchange for some kind of revenue share. If they raise third party capital around the money that we are or that we um, invested with them. And we've done that 20 times, um, which is a lot. You know, we've invested with about, since the, our inception, about 47 different teams. We started doing the seeding practice and strategic partnership practice in 2016. We started with one group and Grover was extremely helpful here. They had done this before on the hedge fund side. So we learned from what they had done before and built this technology around that. Um, and then uh, the first team was a woman named Tammy Jones, um, Basis Investment Group. You know, we built a portfolio with her and then um, seeded her fund. And it worked so well. We, you know, we've done it, you know, 19 times since. So it's been great. And we we do this a lot. We like this. And the, the groups have gone on to raise a lot of capital around the capital that we have managed with these teams. But as I said, in exchange for doing this, in exchange for really launching them in this third-party business, um, we will share in their revenues. Now, the difference between us and a traditional staking business is we have to the only we don't get a permanent rev share forever. We only get a rev share so long as we continue to invest with them. So we think there's alignment there. So a lot of Groups will seed firms and they'll say, listen, in exchange for seeding you, we're going to have a share in your business. And uh, it's perpetual. I understand that model. It's a it's a model people should understand. If someone's going to be there early, it's it, they're going to ask for things like that. Our model is a little bit different. We, we'd rather um, structure it such that uh, we're, we want to, we want to keep growing with them. We want, access to their opportunities. We want to keep investing with them. And only if we do that, do we continue to share. So that's that's the general model. I have to be careful with this because the truth is we've done so many different variations on these themes where sometimes, for example, we'll invest in the opco directly because they have a specialty opco. We may want to do that. We may get some um, more perpetual economic sharing um, but with a buyout mechanism, we've done lots of different things um, and probably shouldn't get too specific, but it gives you an idea. We, um, we, I, I think the difference between, again, between us and others is we're really focused on that much earlier stage team that's starting their practice um, and, and is going to grow. And the goal is for us to work with the team again for a decade. We've done this already with a, a number of teams and ultimately for those teams to get capital from RLPs. So very often RLPs will go direct with the teams that we have have um, have supported and grown. So I'm going to, before we get into the brass tacks of how people track you down to figure out how to get some of this wonderful uh, long-term, you know, aligned capital, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to ask you, you know, on the record, because you and I have had this conversation a lot, 
I'm going to frame up kind of where I see things and I'm curious to get your reaction. But, you know, through the lens of Juniper Square, we serve 2000 GP customers approximately. The vast majority are in real estate because that's where we started. Of those 2000 GP customers, just for round numbers, let's say um, 25% have institutional capital, meaning 75% do not. Of that 75%, let's say 50% have over, I don't know, 15 million, 20 million of equity. I'm using very rough numbers, but they're legitimate businesses who have been around for several years who have transacted, but remember they have no institutional capital. And so when you look at the ownership map of real estate in the US, you know, you've got the fat part of the curve, which obviously are the institutions and the institutional like players. And then you've got the very, very long tail, which range from mom and pops to syndicators to operating businesses, groups that are not capitalized with institutional money. So for those groups that are in the long tail today, what should they know? What should they do? Like, how do you think about that conundrum? Because I know, you know, your team exists, you know, in part to help them, but also to vet and identify. But there's still a lot of these operators who don't know that groups like yours exist. And hopefully this podcast brings awareness to it. But like, how do you think about that conundrum? Is there a supply demand mismatch or is it awareness or is it an evolution? I, I don't, I don't want to like put words into your mouth, but, but that's, that's the problem set. How do you think about that? It goes back to a theme we, we talked about before, um, which is access. So if, we, if for, for these, a lot of these GPs and a lot of GPs that come to our door and start having this conversation with us, um, yeah, a lot of times it's, it's us telling them why they shouldn't try to raise a fund. But, um, but the good news is that most of the time when we work with teams, we say, don't raise a fund. Well, we're going to, let's just buy assets together. Let's get you going. But the truth is that they have to think about, and what we think about all the time is, does institutional capital need that strategy? Do they need that opportunity set? And that's a hard thing to have to tell someone, but that's the truth of it. So I had someone approach me the other day. I was at a conference. This person was great. Really liked this person. Um, and um, they were building an interesting business, but and I don't want to get into the details, but the business was not really something that RLPs really would need. You know, they have all the access to multifamily they need to have, they want, right? They have all the access to industrial they want. They have every access to anything that they want in that sense. So the question I have to put to them is, yes, you may be a great investor, but what are you providing institutional capital? What is it they, and so that's the lens we have to look at all the time. So, um, and, but let me put a positive spin on it. That said, there are groups that come to us that we have worked with that have been phenomenal. They, you know, invest in multiple asset classes. They use operating partners. They're kind of an allocator at times. They kind of direct sometimes. You could kind of say that's a not differentiated business, but they've figured out a way to differentiate it. They figured out a way to say, we're going to still, even though if on the cover it looks like everything else, if you dig deep, it's not. It's different. And, and those are the ones who are successful. It's sort of like, I, I've used this term before. I once had a professor who they graded my test and he said, you know what? You just gave a blinding glimpse of the obvious. And I felt terrible when I read that. He's like, no, no. What I mean is everything's obvious out there. It's all obvious. But you made it appear so that way. You know, not everything, people just don't always see what's right in front of them. And I was like, oh, I like that. So I like to tell that to groups as well. Make it blindingly obvious why this is so compelling. And you'd be surprised what you could do when that happens. But that's why the niche asset classes stand out today. Because it's more, it's more blinding. You're like, oh my gosh, I see it. I see there's not a lot of capital focused on that. I see the opportunity set. It's not a traditional asset class. It's interesting. So that's what I tell a lot of groups. But the other silver lining in all this is you, you and I talked a little bit about high net wealth and uh, retail capital and other forms of capital. The multifamily offices that are out there are getting bigger and bigger and more sophisticated. And they're going to be competing with the institutional capital as a real interesting source of, of capital. That's why there are a lot of big managers out there 
really trying to get that money because that's the next frontier. And and I, I've met, you know, some of these family offices, they're huge. They're bigger than us. They're 100 billion or 200 billion. I'm like, God, I used to think of these RAs, maybe they have a few hundred million, a billion. No, some of these groups are huge and they're getting bigger and they're aggregating and they're consolidating. And so I would say to a lot of these GPs, if you find access to, you know, certainly you should come to groups like us and I could talk about other groups like us or give ideas, but you sh- they should be talking to family offices too. They should figure out it's about getting in business. No, I, I love that. And I mean, on the flip side, there are groups who we know and have worked with that are out there that have raised. I mean, I was on the phone this morning with a GP who raises capital deal by deal, and they've in aggregate raised over $2 billion of investor capital. I mean, that's in not a single institutional check in their business. So it is possible to get to scale without being institutional. Um, you, you mentioned niche asset classes, and I want to kind of conclude on on talking a little bit about what you're what you're seeing and what you're what you like through the lens of what do LPs I, I really like that framing what do your LPs or what do institutional LPs need so um, maybe through that framing how are you thinking about the niche asset classes today and what are you most kind of focused on or, or excited about shout out first to groups like Harrison tree and others who 15 years ago keyed on this theme where they said you know what Let's this, you know, senior housing, student housing, self-storage, less institutional asset classes. Let's get in there. I think they open the eyes for the market to say that's where we need to go. And um, and I think that's where capital is going. Not necessarily to signal those asset classes out. I think they they are varied. I I would frame it this way. Um, all these niches fall within the buckets of traditional asset classes. They're just adjacencies. So you could think about traditional multifamily, but then you could get into manufactured housing, you get into SFR or BTR, low-income housing. You know, these are all niches that that involve some kind of residential opportunity, uh, student housing, senior housing. Same thing is within uh, the industrial sector. You could start with the traditional big box industrial. You go to the last mile industrial, you get into the self-storage, which is kind of a form of it of sorts. You get into the small bay, multi-tenant industrial product. You get into cold storage. Now you get into things like outdoor storage. And that's become a bit of a darling in the in the sector. I'll tell you one niche that I love that we've been spending a lot of time in, in addition to outdoor storage, are things like RV storage. Um, so parking, um, van storage, um, truck storage. There's just so many interesting vagaries. And as our, I like, I, I like to say this, real estate houses our economy and um, ha- houses where we work, you know, where we, how we live and how we get stuff. And as our, how we, how, how our economy evolves, all that stuff evolves as well. So the demographics that are supporting residential opportunities or industrial opportunities or how things are distributed to each other. That's really interesting right now, right now, and the fundamentals are out that are really strong. So I think when you ask, like, what am I interested in? I'm interested in things that draft off of those trends, that draft off where, you know, our e-commerce activity, um, that draft off the need for trucks to support that business uh, and where to put those trucks, where to put the equipment that services industrial product. Um, how to create more affordable housing. All these things are necessary and we, we need more and more of it. So these are kind of the niches I explore. The other thing I like to think about is what real estate, if you see what's become tougher, are things that um, just are, you have a lot less control over. So office has become more difficult and office is a very capital intensive asset class. It's you have to put a lot of money into it to make it work, and then it may not work. So it's it's a very expensive option to own office. So I love asset classes that are capital efficient, things where less than 20% or even less of your NOI goes to CapEx. And whereas office, sometimes as much as 50% or more goes to CapEx. So you think you're buying something for a certain yield, but you got to almost 
cut it in half. It's a very expensive asset class the way it's traditionally run. So I like businesses that are more capital efficient. I like things that draft off these themes. I do love outdoor storage. I love some of the tech enabled uh, businesses that are out there. And we're finding more and more interesting niches that like co-living ideas or short-term leasing for industrial ideas. These are kind of logistics businesses. And the more you tech enable them, the more efficient you can make those businesses and the more profitable those businesses will be. So I don't know if that's too theoretical of an answer, but that's how I, I frame it. No, I love that. I mean, I think it's so fascinating as the search for yield or, or alpha or the illiquidity premium has evolved. You have to go niche, but you, you, you know, if you're a large allocator, you can't do so without an intermediary like yourself or, a, or a, an expert like yourself to help bridge the gap because these are very niche small businesses and they need support and scale. So I think it's fascinating uh, from an evolution of institutional real estate perspective. No, that's it. That's it. I mean, I think, um, and the last thing I'll just finish off on is, is really that, like, this is about the evolution of not only the manager experience, but the capital experience. And I think if anything GPs should take away from all this, it's, it's all about the capital. I hate to say that, but the, our businesses don't exist but for them. So... They're in the driver's seat one way or another. Sometimes they know it, sometimes they don't, but they, they know it. Uh, or they, they, they are. And, um, and so they're searching for return. They're searching for opportunities. I, I mentioned some of the stuff about stake investing. The other thing I left out is sometimes stake investing is just about the access. They want to control the access to the flow of real estate. So you just have to look at where they're going. And right now, the multifamily office is that capital searching for access, just like the institutional capital did 20 years ago. And so we're kind of in this interesting evolutionary moment and the LPs, the traditional LPs are going to get more and more sophisticated and the multifamily offices are going to get more and more allocated. So it's going to be an interesting ride. Uh, on that note, what's the best way for people who are listening to learn more, although you've given a very comprehensive overview, but learn more and or get in touch with you or a member of your team? Yeah, one. I mean, honestly, the easiest way is you just reach out to me. Um, I will either respond or I forward it to the team. Um, and I have a great team. They're super excited. They very intellectually curious. Um, but everyone gets a meeting. Um, may not may not be with me. Probably shouldn't be with me. Honestly, I'll just talk too much. But uh, the team will delve in. We'll we'll take the meeting. We'll t- we'll have the call. Um, and that's the best way. If you, if some reason I don't respond, Brandon, I hope, I hope you don't mind to feel free to reach out to Brandon. Brandon will forward it to me and tell me to call. Actually, also my assistant, Colleen Murphy, is the best person in the world. She's going to be very, very happy when I say this, but you can always reach out to her too. See Murphy at gcmlp.com. She'll come and yell. And, um, but she's amazing and she makes everything happen. But again, it just goes out to the team and then you get a meeting. We appreciate that. And we appreciate everything you're doing for the industry. So thanks so much, Peter. Enjoyed the conversation as always. Love it, Brandon. Thanks for asking me to do this. This is a lot of fun.